So hi everyone, this is Finance Meets Real Estate. Uh, we meet here every Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. We have amazing guests here every week. Uh, we are a YouTube channel, so this is going to be posted on YouTube, Finance Meets Real Estate on YouTube. So make sure to subscribe there as well. And um, yes, yeah, so we have a great guest here today. It's David um, Morgia. Uh, do I pronounce correctly? Just making sure. <laughs> yeah. okay, I, so I tell people about, Morgia uh, like Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so multifamily investor. He's host of the Making Money in Multifamily podcast. And he uh, will go over traditional deal structures found in multifamily syndication. And uh, also like some of the structures in today's market um, in comparison. So that's the topic for today, syndication deal structures. Um, so Dave, he's the principal and founder of uh, David and Travis Capital Group. And uh, so he also, besides his podcast, he also hosts the Capital Raising Lab virtual meetup. And he, he's host of the New York City Investor Network meetup uh, that I'm going to myself this Thursday. And so with that, I think I'm going to pass it on to Dave. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. You can put your questions on the chat. I will relay them at the end as well. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here, Dave. That was, a, that was an amazing intro. Thank you for having me. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, like like Stefan said, my name is Dave Morgia. Um, I'm New York City based and I have, I have some slides. So I think what I'm going to try to do is like go through these like eight to 10 slides um, and I'm going to try to not make it like painful, real high level. And then I'm sure that'll prompt some questions. We can go through them right at the end. So um, bear with me while I set the, the screen share up for that. Um, but yeah, like... Uh, like mentioned, just kind of going over high level um, deal structures, um, specifically for multifamily syndication, which is what I really expertise in. So I think if I had present that, it'll go full screen for you guys. I think if I do it down here. Okay, so is that looking a little better for everyone, hopefully? Um, yeah. So yeah, like I mentioned, syndication structures for multifamily. So um, just going to kind of go through the, the high level of what I'm going to accomplish here. So kind of intro myself, we're going to get into the capital stacks of a deal, basically what you need to do to fund a deal uh, that is essentially debt and equity. So we'll get into debt breakdowns, equity breakdowns, then we'll get into how you basically can structure those equity breakdowns through syndications, which is what I focus on. And then we can wrap it up with some questions. Um, so like mentioned, um, I founded David and Travis Capital Group with my partner, as you guessed it, Travis Eggenberg. Uh, met him here in New York City. Um, and the two of us founded the company a couple of years ago. Um, I bring a background in power utilities. I am from upstate New York. I'm actually up there right now. Uh, you can see the hotel in the back, um, visiting for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, background in power utilities, uh, nuclear power. And now that I'm down in the city, I do uh, combined cycle gas. Uh, so I kind of have that like asset manager background, which is really helpful for real estate. Um, but on the real estate side of things, we focus on multifamily in the Southeast, uh, as you guys probably know that. Southeast is a generally good market to be in. A lot of red states, which politically aside, is very good for investing as far as uh, you know, being able to secure good properties. Um, so we focus really primarily in Central Florida, a little bit in North Carolina, and uh, more vaguely in the Southeast. That's kind of depending on who we partner with. Um, but yeah, as a whole, for a team, we have 64 units in North Carolina in Salisbury, a secondary market in North Carolina, and 186 units we are closing in Orlando. Um, that's going to be wrapping up here in a, a month or so. And that's for $46 million under our management. And like mentioned, I run a podcast and meetup. So if you're in the area, come say hi, or if you want to check out the show, feel free. Stepping into capital stacks. So like I mentioned, we're going to go very high level, and then we're going to kind of break down those levels. So if you equate the capital stack to funding a real estate deal, whether it's a small single family or a large property, it really is pretty much nine, 99 times out of 100 to just piecing together the debt and then piecing together the equity. So for commercial loans, that's gonna range for the debt piece anywhere from 55 to 80% loan to value. And we'll get into kind of more specifically, but essentially after securing that loan, the biggest question is how are you gonna afford actually raising the equity or bringing the equity to do this deal, not only to fund the rest of the loan balance or the equity that you need to fund it, but also any capital improvements that you need to actually get the deal done. Because most business plans, you're probably looking to actually add some value to the property. You're probably looking to actually improve the place to warrant rent increases, all these things. So there's definitely going to be some money you inject into the property as well. So debt breakdowns, um, this is kind of just a, a very simple 
comparison of, of what you typically will see multifamily properties uh, get funded through. So we have agency debt or a small business loans. That is traditionally thought of as a comparison, probably more akin to like a mortgage. So if you're buying just like a single family or a small multi, um, you would think like just a regular mortgage loan. Um, that's going to be government backed by Fannie or Freddie. Uh, it's typically non-recourse and non-recourse essentially means, which is a huge advantage in multifamily space, that they can't go after you if the property performs poorly, which is really nice. So basically the bigger you go, the more kind of, I guess I'll say, um, the less risk of liability for you when you get into these deals. So essentially these deals are so big that they understand that they can't actually go after you as long as you're trying to perform the property properly. There's the one carve out, which is bad boy carve outs if you're siphoning money away. But as long as you're performing, they really can't go after you. The only thing they could do is take the property back. But liability aside, you can walk away free. So that's a huge, huge plus when you talk about bigger deals. And then another pro for the agency debt would be lower interest rates, which of course is, is a big win. Um, since it's government backed by Fannie or Freddie, uh, definitely comes with guarantees with that so they can afford to give you better rates. Cons for those, however, would be that the property must be stabilized. So since it is government backed, they do appreciate and demand that the property has 90% uh, stabilization, which is I think three months if I'm being correct. So you have to have the last three months of data has to be 90% stabilized, which is good and bad. Essentially the government is saying they want to make sure that the property you have is actually performing. Um, it does obviously restrict cases when you can apply agency debt to your property. So a little bit of a trade-off there. The leverage for these deals is also typically a little bit lower. Um, like I mentioned on the slide a couple back, it's um, 55 to 80%. So usually for agency debt, it's going to probably range at least today around the 55 to 65% range, just the way kind of the debt market is right now. Um, that's where you step into the bridge that I'll talk about in a second, where you get a little bit more leverage. But right now, a little bit lower leverage just based on the market we're in. And then last but not least, if you've ever done an FHA loan uh, just for like a single family house, it can be quite slow to close since um, you kind of have the government involved, right? So there's a couple more check boxes to hit uh, that just slows things down. But other than that, um, it's not too bad of a process. You just have to plan ahead a little bit more. Um, the flip side of agency would be bridge. And for that, you could kind of equate it to a hard money loan if you're thinking of single family. Uh, the pros of that would be that it's definitely more flexible. You can get more creative lenders involved who will do uh, a little bit different capital stacks and structures for you. Uh, like I mentioned, the leverage for these deals would be higher so you can get a higher loan to value. You can also get your CapEx included. So I mentioned you were gonna have to typically raise for CapEx if you're gonna improve the property. Depending on your bridge lender, you can actually get CapEx, either some or all of it included in the actual loan that you can get. So your loan to value would turn into the loan to cost and that could get upwards to 80%, which is pretty good. Now, I will say that you don't always wanna take max, max leverage in the deal. Um, there are cases where that is too risky, but the option is on the table with certain bridge lenders to be able to take a little bit more leverage if you need it to work for a deal. And then since they are more flexible and not government backed, hard money loans, AKA bridge loans are quicker to close with the bank. The cons are pretty much the flip to agency. You are working with private lenders, which means that if you're not working with a good one, you really could get bit. So don't just assume that any bridge lender is a good one, same that you would with a hard money loan. You gotta make sure you're working with the right team. Um, there is a potential for recourse debt. So I mentioned the liability on the agency side was wiped away. There are certain lenders where depending on the deal, if it's a hairy one, you could be on the hook for recourse if that's what they want to be able to feel secure and actually funding the deal for you. They might want you to put your kind of skin in the game and actually say, well, this is a pretty dicey deal and we want you to, to be on the hook for this one in case it goes south. Um, I would say most times it's not like a huge, huge thing that's happening. Um, most times even with bridge, you can get non-recourse debt. We're getting uh, non-recourse debt for a bridge deal, um, but it is something to just be aware of and know the risks there. And then last but not least, the interest rates are flipped on a deal with bridge. Uh, typically trending, you know, a, a little bit higher and you're probably going to have to uh, just be careful and conscious of that um, going forward. 
so rough numbers for this, um, and this is kind of across both agency and bridge. And I, I kind of alluded to it before, I, I couldn't see because the column was actually covering it, but uh, 55 to 80% loan to value or loan to cost. So yeah, like I mentioned, agency right now, kind of looking at 55 to 65%. Um, bridge, probably looking at right now, eh, 65 to 75%. Not much is hitting 80% these days, just the way the markets are trending, uh, the way interest rates are rising. And I mentioned that loan to cost uh, could be at play when you're talking about uh, bridge debt. Um, one thing about loan to cost as well, uh, when considering something like that, it's not just like a free check on CapEx. It's not something where you can just say, oh, I want $5 million uh, extra money on a $10 million property to do you know, whatever the heck I want to. You have to have a business plan in place, show them the business plan, show them the estimated cost, show them some quotes uh, to say, okay, I actually need about a million to improve this property. Here's what we plan to do with it. Here's why we justify that type of cost um, and not just say, we, we want that money just because. So it's not, it's not like you can just completely fund the deal and, and kind of skirt one away from them. So um, everything's justified. Lenders want to know where their money's going at the end of the day. Uh, continuing on terms, 30-year uh, amortization. So that's similar to what you would get on a single family home. Um, sometimes it's 25-year AM. I, I'm seeing mostly 30, depends on the deal. Uh, what differs though, is that when you're talking about big properties, commercial lending, uh, the term is not also 30 years like single family would be. You're usually talking three to 10 year terms. Most found is a five year term. So it amortizes over 30 years, but there's a balloon payment at year five. So you pay payments for five years and then they come knocking for the loan to be made whole by five years. So that's why you'll see in the space, a lot of deals or almost every single deal, if you're doing them right, has a five year or less business plan. Basically the business plan on the property should be shorter than the actual debt. Because if you have a business plan that's longer than the debt, it's a very dangerous game to play because you either have to account for a refinance or you might get caught holding the bag and not be prepared to sell in all these really, really bad situations where the lender could take the property back. Interest rates, like I mentioned, would be a little bit higher on the bridge, a little bit smaller on agency. Um, right now in the market, it's pretty chaotic, I, to be frank. Um, even, the, even the debt that we got for our property was moving pretty fluidly until we, we secured our final quote here. Um, but agencies still can get into the fours, probably more like five, and the bridge is a little bit higher than that. Um, those numbers are huge rules of thumbs, guys. Don't really take that to heart by any measure. Um, any property you're looking at, you would want to get a, a decent quote to start underwriting uh, the deal. Um, don't just throw a number and hope it's right. Um, maybe as a starting point, just to get a feel for how the deal looks if you're, if you're looking at it. But um, before you get serious about putting in offers, make sure you have a, a, an actual better idea of where it would fall. And then interest only. So a nice thing about these deals and the debt that you can get with these, when you go bigger, you get a better product. A better product in lending would be that you can get some creative terms. Um, you won't see this in small multi, but in large multi and large commercial, you can get interest only payments. So instead of paying principal and interest, uh, you can pay interest only, which the benefit to that is that you could cash flow more quicker, more quicker, more quickly um, day one. So instead of paying, call it $100,000 a year in debt or $100,000 a month in debt, you could pay $40,000, uh, which is obviously going to help the cash flow on the property. Um, now, granted, you aren't paying principal down at that time, which could affect, you know, the sale later on. You're going to have more principal to pay back. But based on your business plan, oftentimes these days, it's still making a lot of sense to go interest only, at least for a couple of years. And then close is, is pretty typical, 1% to 3%, depending on the deal. Um, definitely depends on, on the type of lender and the size of the deal. Uh, not uncommon to see that, you know, across any, any type of, of fee for, for a loan. All right, so equity, this is where it's gonna get a little more fun. I was trying to be brisk about this, um, but we're gonna get into basically, you know, how, how you fund the equity side of the piece of the business. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go right to left here, but in an ideal world for some, a self-funded deal would be fantastic. You know, it's truly your own deal, high risk, high reward. It's your own money. Um, you would make all the decisions. You have no active partners with you. 
Um, the one caveat I will say, if you're looking at a deal that you actually can fund on your own, you know, given you have the, the funding to do it, is I would still make sure that you have the money in there to hire a team, whether it's a property manager, asset manager, uh, whatever the structure is. Um, at the end of the day, it may cash flow or make sense day one with you doing all the work and the leverage, but uh, there may come a time where you actually want to step away from that aspect of the business and work on growing and scaling. And I've seen this many, many times where you step into it, everything's great. You don't mind doing the property management. You don't mind doing the asset management. And then that day comes where you get bored of doing those tasks and you want to work on the bigger picture stuff, working on different aspects of the business. But the property that you were managing doesn't cash flow unless you're doing the work. And to me, that just means you bought yourself a job uh, instead of buying yourself a cash flowing property because you now can't step away from it without losing the cash flow. So something to keep in mind there, if you are looking at a deal that you could actually fund yourself, just make sure you have the process in place to kind of look ahead is all I would say there. Um, one iteration away from that would probably be a joint venture where you would bring in partners who, you know, through some agreement, you bring in you know, a similar amount of money, or maybe one brings in the one, one brings in the work, uh, that type of thing. Um, still pretty flexible. You can, as long as you trust your business partner, which is a whole other conversation, but as long as you trust them, um, it, it makes it pretty simple as far as the process go. The only caveat would be um, that they also have control of the property and decisions on the property. You know, you set up an LLC with them to, to decide on, on what goes down, um, how you manage it, how you operate it when you sell it. So, um, Again, just make sure that you have the right partnerships in place to make sure that you know um, you'll be on the same page and you can talk through those things. And the one in white, the one we're really going to dig into today, which is why I kind of highlighted it in the middle here in white, but uh, syndication. So that is um, basically my bread and butter. It's what me and Travis do. It is what you'll see a lot of operators who operate these larger deals do. Uh, syndication just at the highest level means raising money to get a project done. It doesn't have to be multifamily or even real estate in general, it just means to syndicate to bring together. Um, so what that boils down to is having general partners, which Travis and myself would be, and then raising money through limited partners, passive shares to fund the deal. Um, so what that would do is two things. It would make me and Travis fiduciarily responsible to our investors, of course, um, as an investor, you would have stake in the deal, but you would be 100% passive. You don't have those voting rights that a joint venture would have. Instead, you're writing a check, you get updates on the deal, and then you basically have mailbox money. The only downside to that is you don't have control. There's a lot of upsides, though. I personally invest passively and actively, um, and it's just kind of whatever you prefer. Um, and then at the base, base, base level, uh, syndications have to be SEC compliant. It is just like the bare minimum um, that makes a syndication a syndication. And I'm going to get into the carve outs here, which, which remain you SEC compliant. Um, but it's just something to be hyper aware of if you're looking to be active is to make sure that you're doing the right things in these deals uh, to make sure you don't get in trouble. Um, right now, I would say we're still in a pretty rosy environment, even though we are kind of getting into interesting waters with interest rates and, and kind of certain asset classes. Uh, obviously the stock market's kind of doing a lot lately, um, but really the SEC starts knocking when stuff goes south. When investors start getting burned is when they're gonna start sniffing around a little bit. So I would say that now is the best time to make sure you're doing the right things. Not that you shouldn't be always anyways, but you need to be especially careful now to make sure that you're not doing uh, any improper things when it comes to raising money. Uh, because if you are doing those types of things, I would argue that the SEC is probably getting ready to, to start looking at people a little bit more closely. So I'll leave it at that. All right, so here's, here's the syndications kind of breakdown. Um, the bread and butter two types of rules that most syndicators will offer. Um, there is like fund models and stuff like that. I don't really wanna get into that today. It's not really what I do. So I'm not even an expert in it quite yet. And I wouldn't want to pretend to be so, um, but two syndication kind of avenues, sections in the SEC uh, titles, uh, 506 B and C, you may have heard of them before, maybe not, uh, but essentially these are two sections in the SEC law that make a fundraiser or a, a money raiser exempt from filing um, 
to the SEC. So these two channels, as long as you do things correctly, you do not have to actually file. You just have to make sure that you behave with the law and you can raise money without filing, which is a very costly, time intensive thing. Um, so at a high level, 506B and 506C, I like to just say to people, B is for buddy, C is for colleague. Um, so 506Bs, you're allowed accredited and sophisticated investors, uh, but they have to be people you know. So you have to have known them already. You would have to, if the SEC asked, prove that you had a relationship with them. Usually um, that's going to be defined as like you've met them multiple times, met them multiple ways. I don't think there is a hard rule as of the last time I looked on what the definition is, but a lot of guidance from SEC attorneys would be like at least eight contacts, whether it's, you know, through emails, through texts, through personal meetups, that type of thing. Um, if you think you're worried about being able to prove that to the SEC, if they were to ever ask, I would probably just suggest that you don't know them well enough is what I would say. It's better to be safe than sorry. And maybe you just let them in on the next deal after you guys have another cup of coffee or something like that. Um, could you get them in the deal and will the SEC ever ask? Probably not. They probably won't ever ask, but I, I would like to think that uh, you should do your best to make sure that you're following the rules and, and the rules I'll kind of go over too. just kind of have the investors uh, in mind. Um, really, when you think about it, they want to allow you to raise money for people that in this case, potentially aren't accredited, aren't actually uh, high net worth individuals uh, through the sophisticated definition. Um, so it could be dicey in the SEC's eyes to allow you to raise money from someone who A, isn't educated, and then B, you don't even know. It seems pretty predatory in their eyes. So that's kind of the logic there. Um, and 506C, which is the basically flip of that, they say, okay, you can advertise, but it's for accredited peoples only. So, uh, and just for rewind, accredited in this definition through the SEC, which people say is changing, but hasn't yet, would be that you make 200K a year, or you have a net worth of $1 million, and that million dollars can't include your pri primary residence. So the SEC, for better or worse, says that this definition of this person who makes 200K or 300K married or is worth a million dollars is smart enough to know how to invest their money. Um, so that's why they, at that point, say, OK, you can advertise that person. And they don't have to be someone you know. They can be a colleague or just someone you just met. That's kind of the two lines of thought there. Um, so as long as you are following those rules, you will generally be good. Um, if you're doing a 506B, I highly recommend you do not advertise online about the deal specifically. And if you're going to be sharing stuff on social media, most STC attorneys, which I am not, would recommend that you keep a consistent posting, I guess, cadence. So if you're post in once a week, once a week, once a week, but then you have a deal come up and then you're posting seven times that week and then the deal is closed and then you don't post once a week, once a week, once a week, that's going to look very suspicious to anybody, uh, you know, kind of looking over your activity. Whereas if you just had the same consistent posting, you, you would probably just be looked at as, oh, he, he tends to post a lot. She tends to post a lot. Um, even if it's not deal related, you know, if you're still posting a lot around those deals, it still looks very suspicious. So be careful of that as well. On the flip side, 506C, like I mentioned, you can advertise. So if you want to do the Facebook ads, you want to do the Instagram ads, do whatever the heck you want. Um, what will happen though, is when you do these 506C offerings, you have to actually prove that these people are accredited. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to ask them to have their CPA send them send you a letter that shows their accreditation status, or there are certain companies that actually do third-party accreditation, um, which is, is helpful too if they don't have an attorney that could do it themselves. So all in all, the STC just kind of takes a step back and says, what makes sense um, to protect these investors? Because there's a lot of these small to medium deals out there that we don't need to necessarily have registered, but we need to make sure that everyone's protected at the same time. So these are kind of the rules they came up with. And these have relatively been successful, I would say. I mean, it, it makes everybody pretty happy. All the investors have, have liked the process uh, from what I gather over the last decade or so. And uh, obviously a lot of the syndicators have, have proven to do pretty well with these uh, rules as well. Um, and then last but not least here is kind of what you would see uh, through these syndication offers. So generally for the work that's being done for a syndicator and for what makes sense for an investor, this is just kind of very high level, again, very vague. 
rules of thumbs are like super, like don't hold me to it or anything like that because it's very deal dependent. But um, this is generally, if you're looking at like offerings in the market, if you happen to know an operator or you happen to know or have seen an ad, uh, this is generally probably what you'll see. Um, so five to 8% preferred return and preferred return just means that uh, you as in the passive investor, the limited partner would get paid first before the operator gets paid. So the first five to 8% of cash flow will be paid out to the investors 100% of it. After that five to 8%, then it would go into a split. So it, that split could be anywhere from like 50, 50. So after that 8%, 50 could go to the passive investor, 50 could go to the operator, or maybe it's 80 goes to the investor, 20 goes to the operator. It's generally not gonna go the reverse way where um, the operator would get 80%. Typically the worst it would get is 50-50 from what I've seen. I've seen very rare cases of that, but um, this is generally the split. Um, so basically what that would look like year one is okay, the property cash flows just say 10%. So if it's a seven pref on this deal, uh, the investors would get 7%. And then if it's an 80-20 split, uh, there's 3% left over. So they'd get 80% of that 3%, which would be 2.4%. So they would have a total of the seven plus a 2.4, which is 9.4. And then the 6.6% would be sent to the operator uh, on that deal specifically, just as a quick example. And if I'm going too fast, we can go through other ones later. I'm totally fine with that. Um, back to the preferred returns, there's something that's usually called a catch up. Um, and usually that's cumulative. So what that'll mean is that say in that prior example, instead of year one cash flows, it was um, more like a 4% cash on cash just because like maybe it needed a lot of work and it wasn't stabilized yet or something like that. Um, what would happen is, okay, you got your 4%, the full 4%, but then the next year it was a 10% cash on cash. Now you get the extra couple percent on the back end of that one. So if it was a six prep and it was 4% year one and 10% year two, you actually get 4% year one, but then you get the 6% plus the 2% to make up for it. And you get your total of 12 over the two years. Um, so that's just kind of how that works too. Usually that'll happen in cases where, like I mentioned, there isn't a ton of cash flow day one, but they know the property will definitely cash flow in the next couple of years, um, you know, pretty aggressively just because there's a big value add play. Uh, there's a lot of improvement to the property, a lot of rent growth, that type of thing. Um, so the operators will put that in there to be um, just, showing their confidence to say, listen, we know this property is going to do well. We want to make sure that you get all the cash flow you're entitled to. We're going to catch you up in the deal. Um, and then getting into kind of returns, just like high level numbers, IRR is an internal rate of return. It's just kind of like a time-based return metric. It's kind of helpful to compare it to the stock market. Um, and anywhere from a 15 to 20% IRR is typical in the industry. And then AAR is at the average. So it's not time-based. It's just the average annual uh, and that's 17 to 25%. Um, and then over a three to seven year hold, typically five years, usually most of these deals will go from 1.5 to 2.5 multiples. If I were to pin a number on a five-year deal, it's usually like a 2X. So most deals, you might go like 7% uh, cash flow per year. And then with the, the sale, you'll end up with doubling your money in five years. Um, again, these are highly variable. Don't hold me to these numbers because every deal is different. Every risk on a deal is different. Uh, just trying to give you a sense of it if you haven't uh, come across these, these types of uh, offerings before. That's really all I had. I wanted to like make it light because, um, and I think I went longer than I wanted to actually, uh, but I wanted to open it up to questions and, and see uh, if anybody had anything uh, that they just wanted to bring up. Um, but yeah, I got my website email. So if, if it's something you don't want to share here, but want to reach out to me, uh, definitely feel free. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you kind of take over from here. <laughs> yeah, uh, go ahead, guys, with any, with, with any questions, actually. Thanks, Dave, for the presentation. Uh, it was yeah, sure. Really great. And, um, yeah, if, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead. Yeah, CJ. Uh, do you have any uh, like calculators you'd recommend as you're looking at kind of structuring a deal and figuring out, you know, how much uh, you can offer to an investor uh, when you've got a, a deal loaded up? Yeah, um, I guess there's a few ways to answer that. Uh, there's a bunch of underwriting models out there. Um, 
it also depends on what types of deals you're doing. Uh, if you're talking like large scale multi, which I'm into like hundred plus unit deals. Um, some of my favorites are, um, I'll use, I have my own, but it's, I haven't been using it uh, quite a while cause I kind of broke it up trying to update it, but then I just haven't gotten back to it. Uh, I plan to release that to people here eventually, but, uh, for the time being, I'm using Rob Beardsley is a great resource for that. Uh, pretty phonetically spelled Beardsley. Um, Michael Blank has a model that's really good. Um, and David Tupin has a popular model that a lot of people like T-O-U-P-I-N. Uh, those would be the three guys that have models that I think are either free or cheap and everyone seems to seems to like generally. Um, those models are pretty hefty. So if you have not done any underwriting before, uh, it may be pretty intimidating. Um, so just keep that in mind. But they are very useful. And once you kind of get used to how they work, they're, they're really helpful. Um, if you're, if you're newer to Excel or not great with Excel, um, I not sure if I have a smaller resource for you, but, uh, there's probably tutorials on those models as well. Perfect. And can you give those names one more time here? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can drop them in the chat too. It's uh, Rob Beardsley, uh, David Tupin and Michael Blank. I'm not sure pricing on any of those. I think Rob's is free. Um, he's he's a friend of mine here in the city. I think it's still free. I believe Tupins and Michaels is paid. I, I don't know how much. I don't use them. I've, I've used Michaels just like secondarily before. It seems okay. Uh, but people, people have great opinions on the other two as well. I just would uh, only personally recommend Rob's because I, I use his sometimes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. No problem. So you wouldn't know, uh, Dave, like how it compares to, to Michael Blanks, because I've seen Michael Blanks. I don't, I don't really use any of them to be frank, but I, I've seen his, his model and it's kind of, it's just kind of an advanced spreadsheet, right? That's how it is. It yeah. Is, that's why I, that's why I did a caveat like there. The Some of them are pretty heavy, right? Like they're they're If you first time, like looking at a deal, especially if you've only done like smaller deals, um, it might be a little bit too much, especially if you've never like looked at trying to use a syndication model or anything like that. Um, but they're re really useful. I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think if you haven't used them, I would probably just recommend you go through like a really clean deal and just use really easy numbers and just kind of get a feel for how all the cells work together. Um, but I, I consider myself kind of okay with Excel. So I'm not sure the learning curve there. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, yeah, I usually build my own tools for everything but but kind of yep. um right but in terms of i was curious actually rob's uh, rob's sheet is it like very like model is it kind of fairly advanced or like how does it compare in your opinion to the others is it, um I, rob as well but i haven't seen his um you know underwriting thing see that's the thing i'm gonna go just on off video quick while i get a charger but i'm still talking um okay. the the thing about i think all of the spreadsheets in general is like it's really just personal preference I find Rob's to be pretty clean and easy to uh, understand. Um, I also did a series with him uh, on my podcast way, way back in the day. So maybe that's why I got used to it and just understood it. Um, but if I'll say this, like if you're going through these three and hopefully you don't pay too much and not use them, but if you, you kind of try a few out and, um, and like or don't like one and you, you find it pretty quick that you don't like one, your gut's probably right. It probably just like doesn't click with your brain quite right. Um, and, and another one might kind of make sense more. Um, so I won't say just like buy a bunch of them and, and pick your favorite because that's might be a waste, waste of money maybe. But um, if you're finding it hard to, to get used to, maybe there's a reason for that too. But yeah, I like Rob's. It's uh, It seems pretty, pretty clean. Uh, the summaries are, are really good. Um, the whole thing about underwriting is it's like blending art and science really essentially. Um, there's nuances to the numbers, but then at the end of the day, it's also math too. So if you can use a model that helps you wrap your head around the deal, because it takes hours to underwrite these things, it goes from like, okay, my rents are here to here, to then just going sell by sell and throwing all these variables in, throwing all these assumptions in. If it's hard for you to kind of paint that picture on the model, um, 
then it's it's going to be really oh, there's going to be a lot of friction there. It's it's going to be pretty tough in my mind. But if you kind of know where things affect things and you can kind of see how it kind of plays together and how how they all kind of work together, all these these different levers um, through the model, because uh, it's one thing to know them like outside in theory, but it's another thing to like see them react when you're inside the models. Um, I, I would say just if you feel good about one, your your gut's probably right. It's probably the one you like. So. Mm -hmm. And so just a little bit about yourself, like in terms of like the deals that you guys do with Travis. Yeah. So what, uh, so you mentioned like, so hundred plus units, uh, for it in Texas, yep. that's your current uh, focus. Um, so what, what is your like current, like so far, like track record or like in terms of like deals you guys have done, if you want to share with us, like perhaps like a case study or something like this, it, I think it would be interesting for people to kind of go through. Yeah. Um, so what's the best way to do this? Um, I'll go back to the first slide too, because they had it on there just for reference, but um, yeah. we have two deals under our belt. Um, but our goal the whole time was to go big fast. Um, my background is in power plants. Like I mentioned, I operate like multi-million dollar power plants. So in my mind, asset management on a multifamily property isn't that complicated. Uh, the numbers aren't too hard for me and the managing of contractors and that stuff I do every day, um, putting together business plans I do every day. So from that aspect, I was not kind of nervous to get into bigger stuff. And then on the flip side, Travis uh, has a background in commercial brokerage in Manhattan. So he's doing multi-million dollar deals in the city on leasing. Uh, he represents uh, basically uh, like companies under leases. So he's like tenant side leasing. So he, from his perspective, is really good at talking to brokers at a high level are really good at transacting, doing deals in general. Um, so the both of us just kind of, once we found each other, got together and said, we just want to like go big fast, like not do smaller deals. Uh, we'd rather get into the product we want like immediately. So that was kind of like the high level of like what we were looking to do. Um, so with that, we kind of just took that, broke it down, started building relationships. I started a podcast. He kept working on his relationships. Um, we started working with other operators. So we closed that 64 unit deal in North Carolina. That deal is not one that we sourced, but it's one that we got brought in because we built out our relationships. So um, one thing about this business is it's it's hard to start sometimes, especially if you're going big right away. Um, but if you find people that like you and you can that you can add value to, that's that's the big one. I mean, liking is one thing, but if you can do something for them and help them close the deal or do something else, that's the big thing. Um, if you can find a way to to make it a, a symbiotic relationship, I would say that's that's a big win. Um, so that's how we got our first deal done. Just if you hold on to that just for a second. So what are some value sure. that you can provide to other coders you, sure. you can suggest kind of to our audience? Because I mean, yes, yeah, so typical one is kind of bringing the deal. But in case you don't bring the deal, what are yep. some things you can do for them? Yeah, I would say right now, um, there's like, there's two main prongs to most deals. And then there's like a third prong, which is, is also important. Um, so I'm going to be, I guess I'll go through them. So the main thing is like, if you can find a deal, like especially in this market where deals are dicey, if you can find one, you're going to be everyone's favorite. Operators are looking to close deals every day. So if you have a good deal, uh, somebody um, somebody wants it. They just need to know you and trust you. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is kind of basically like this presentation was, um, you, need to, you need to capitalize the deal. You need to actually be able to afford the deal. So if you have a good relationship with high net worth people or you're able to capital raise um that is a good asset to have a good kind of notch in your belt um i will say huge 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 asterisk on this because you cannot be an active partner in a deal and only capital raise uh back to the sec um they don't allow you to just come in and raise money and walk away you would have to have a broker dealer license for that so if you're gonna primarily raise money for a deal you also need to be participating in the deal, uh, whether it's asset managing, whether it's helping close the deal, whatever it is. Basically, if you were to come to me, Dave, and say, hey, I want to raise you know, a couple hundred K, a million bucks for your deal, um, I would say, okay, what else do you plan on doing to help us out with this deal? Because I can't just have you come in and raise some money and walk away. Otherwise, we're all going to get in trouble. Uh, so just keep that in mind. But it is a very useful skill that everyone is still looking for because uh, uh, deals are out there to this day, always getting closed and there's always money needed to fund them. So that's super useful. Um, third, and kind of what I mentioned already is, is if you have a background kind of similar to mine where you have 
of experience, whether it's closing kind of like Travis, or you kind of understand how to work with property managers or contractors more like I do, or you kind of pick up our business plans, that type of thing. You can help close the actual deal. If, if, if the team needs help with that, that's, that's the other one. Um, after that, it's really just so dependent on the person and what they're looking for. Um, I won't say just ask a person like, what can I help you with? Cause that's very vague. Um, but I would just say like, pay attention to what your own strengths are and find a way to equate that to multifamily. Like if you're a person that's talented in graphic design, say maybe you put together the pitch deck or, or something like this, you know, you put together like the actual offering memorandum so that the investors have something to look at with all the slides and all that stuff. There's, there's a million ways to help out. Um, you just have to make sure that your help is needed and, uh, and I guess worth partnering for is, is what I'll say. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Scott has a couple of questions. Um, okay, I can relate though, I guess. <laughs> so, so number one, so how are you finding these deals? Assume they are all of market. Are we building relationships with owners? Oh yeah, I'm seeing it in the chat. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the first deal, 64 units, the one that we did not find personally, that was an off market deal. Um, that's why building relationships in this business is huge. Um, just like our partners are looking for deals, uh, we're looking for deals through partners too. Um, it's, it's really just a team effort out there. Um, rising tide lifts all ships. We all need each other's help. Uh, as long as you like the people you're working with, it's, it's really fun to get together on these things and close them. Um, that was found off market. Um, the 186 units that we found in Orlando, that was actually found by me and Travis on market. Um, it was just a very interesting deal in a very interesting time in the market. Um, and I could probably talk about that for an hour, but we're going to run out of time. Um, but that is through primarily for these size deals is going to be regardless of the situation, um, broker relationships. I I'll tell you right now, you're not going to find these deals truly off market. Um, at least once you get like past like 60, 80 units, like maybe there's a mom and pop seller out there that owns 80 units on their own, but probably owned by like a group, like of some form or fashion, whether it's a family office, whether it's like another syndication group, whether it's like a fund manager. Like it's owned by someone with a business plan. It's not owned by like some mom and pop that just like has no idea what they're doing. Um, and since they have no, since they have a clue what they're doing and they're not just kind of wandering about owning real estate, um, they're going to have the sense to list it with a broker or at least soft list it with a broker. Um, they may not want to put it to market truly, but they may go to a broker they have a good relationship with and say, hey, can, do you have a, uh, you know, a few people in mind for this deal? Uh, if so, let me know and let me know if you can get X price. I just kind of want to test things out. And that right there, that little window is like probably where the money's made at these size of deals. Um, because if you're getting the pocket listing, which is what they call it sometimes, it's as close to off market as it gets in large commercial multi. Um, you're again, I don't think there's truly like a, a truly off market deal. A mom and pop seller, like above say 80 units, maybe like needle in a haystack. But if you can have a good in with brokers, if you're, you know, really close to these guys, always on their radar, like I'm looking for these specific deals, you know, really niched into a certain market. Um, you want to be the first one they think of when the sellers go asking, Hey, do you have one in mind for this property? So that's, that's what I would say there. It's always broker relationships in my mind for this size. Mm -hmm. Got it. So I got a question actually on a private message from Bradley. So what is the value of high-level property managers that know how to add value to the property and manage the asset? Uh, what was the first yeah. part? The, the What is the value of them? Yeah, what is the value of, uh, well, high-level property managers that know how to add value to the property and manage the asset? Um like what is, uh, what is the monetary value? Like how much you pay them or like what, like what are they worth to, to help perform? Uh, I guess I'll answer both. Uh, for large deals like this, um, you're looking at usually a 3% property management fee of the gross rents, the gross revenue of the property. So if you make, you know, 100, 100K a month in rents, they'll get 3% of that. Um, and then also you're usually paying salaries because there's full-time employees there. If it's a smaller property where there's not full-time people, you're paying like 6%. So it's not, un it's not unlike property management and smaller scale where you're paying like six to 8%. Uh, it's just kind of split up differently. So instead of 8%, you're paying 3% plus salaries basically. Um, and usually the salary people come in full-time starting at like hundred plus units, uh, hundred to 120 is like where you warrant uh, full-time usually. The value, I guess, like intrinsically, extrinsically, 
is insurmountable because there's no way you're going to have the time to manage that property on your own. And you probably don't have the experience um, to have done that on your own. If you already have PM experience in large multi and you know all the tools, all of the like tech stacks and all the kind of management intricacies, um, that's that's right where you could add value to someone day one. Like I, I have a PM business. I know how to run it. I'll help you manage that thing. Um, that, that's easy. But most people don't have that. And I would say, uh, if, if you're asking that, you probably don't have it either. So it's insanely valuable slash necessary to have a PM, uh, you know, at scale that knows what they're doing to run a big property like that. Mm -hmm. And so, so next question from CJ, actually. So is there a definition that should be used to determine an existing relationship for a body in like the 506 bit base? So is this something as simple as a direct message with them from a Facebook group? Can you also maybe talk? to what defines advertising. Can I blast an email out to people I have a relationship with, with letting them know about an investment opportunity? Yeah, there is no like SEC definition of like who, who you have an existing relationship with, like who is your buddy. Um, what they recommend is, is the more frequent, the better, or the more uh, interactions, the better. Um, if you're talking just like spamming a message on Facebook and counting, probably not. But like, if you're actually talking to that person one-on-one -on -one and they're replying that type of thing, you know, that's an interaction all day. Um, I would, to me, like in your gut, you could like probably say to yourself, like that was like an authentic interaction, even if it's just like a handshake and talking for 15 minutes for a coffee, or if it's just like an email thread for a couple threads in a row, like that's real to me. If it's just like, Hey, check out this stuff I'm doing. And it's like a very, just like send out without like any response back that just like in my book won't count. And I mean, again, the sec might not come looking at something like that, but that's, that's not really going to fly. So um, like me and Travis always have the, the mantra where like, if we, we don't want anyone, we don't know investing in a 506 B deal anyway, just because of the structure of the deals. Um, so we don't feel comfortable regardless of what the sec says. Um, but if you're having any doubts, I would just tell them to wait for the next one and keep up conversations for the next few months until you got the next deal rolling around. Um, and I'm looking at the chat, the next part of that for advertising, uh, that's for the 506C. So where you have accredited only, right. Um, advertising would be in that definition, um, pretty much anything deal specific if we're talking like brass tacks. So if you are like showing the deal before it's closed, that is hundred percent advertising. So our deal that we're closing in Orlando, we can advertise and I can talk about today with all of you strangers. Hi, everyone, uh, because it's 506C and I, you guys can all come into this deal today if you wanted to, but it's because you have to be accredited. Um, that's why, you know, I could talk about this deal. Any deal that you see online before it closed, you know, people offering to raise money on should be 506C. If you're seeing like a post, a post on Facebook or an Instagram and the deal isn't closed, you, you better hope that those people are 506 C uh, raisers for that deal, or they really should be, they're going to get in trouble. Um, odds are. So that's, that's what I would say there. If it's, if it's literally just like a public post where there's no filter on, um, you can't control who sees it, that's advertising, right? If it's an email blast and you, you know, everyone on the email list, or at least you've interacted a couple of times, that's different. But if you have no control over who sees it, that's to me advertising. So. So yeah, so next question from Scott actually again. So how much of your own money are you putting into these deals? Do the 506C investors cover a good percentage of the down payment? Yeah, so um, I assume that means how much of my own money. So I'll always put in money into my own deals. Um, it depends on the deal, um, but I'll always put in what's called skin in the game. So depending on my current financial situation, what uh, you know, what I have for you know, cash in the bank, liquidity. I'm always putting money in to make myself a little bit uncomfortable to make sure that I'm aligned in the deal. And I would say as a suggestion that you make sure that anybody you're going to do a deal with, if you're writing a check is the operator is going to do the same thing. Um, it's just alignment of interest, right? So I have my money in, you have your money in. It makes sense that we're both vested, literally invested monetarily in this deal. Um, and yeah, the, the investors cover the whole down payment. So back to that first slide, like that whole down payment is the equity. So that, that's the whole piece. So if it's, you know, 70% loan to value, that 30% is all raised through these 506 BRC avenues. If like I'm doing the deal. So if it's a, uh, in this case for the Florida deal, a $41 million deal, we needed to raise and are raising 15 million. Cause that's the basically 30% that we need to raise for this deal. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of how that boils out. So same, same as a single family house, you get a, you get a loan for 80%, you got to have the money for the other 20. In this case, we raise the money and we pay investors for, for bringing it in. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, so do you use the kind of like, I mean, I presume like core GP model as in bringing other core GPs on, on the deal of this size or like what's your approach? Yeah. Yeah, so this deal specifically, um, we you know we work hard again. Networking is everything as business. So um, on certain deals, uh, we always have kind of certain partners we have in mind that we want to bring into these things. Um, so we we found the deal, we helped close it, but we're also bringing in um, basically a team that's bigger than us. So we talk about like adding value, like our value add to these guys who are ten times as big as us um, was to bring them this deal and involve them. They have. A complete vertical stack. They're vertically integrated. They have their own property management team. They're starting their own insurance um, section. Uh, they have their own general contractor. Like they do everything, soup to nuts. So it's just the same part of value add is like we found this great, great deal in Orlando, huge property, and we want to bring in like the best of the best and we want to partner with the best of the best. Um, so yeah, co GP model for this one. Uh, we're going to help raise some more money for it. They're going to bring in. Uh, a good chunk too, but yeah, that was that was how we got this one done. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So, do you want to talk about a little bit about let's say the markets that you guys? Because I, I know you say you're like Central Florida, okay, basically the south southeast, right? Central Florida, yep. like, you know, uh, southeast. So, how did you choose those? I mean, those are like really big markets for multifamily in general. But yeah, what made you go there as opposed to, um, I mean, other you know, Texas or other, or Western markets and so forth. Yeah, there's, um, there's a million ways to decide what market to invest in. Um, there's a couple approaches to it. Uh, some of it can be personal. Uh, we are on the East Coast. Uh, I realistically don't see us flying out to the West Coast anytime soon to invest in Phoenix, uh, at least while we're small. So personally, uh, like that's just not going to happen. So that, that eliminated all the, the kind of West coast Phoenix stuff and all that, that you, you maybe see in the market. Um, you know, you can make money anywhere, but you got to end up picking something. So we eliminated that. We got to the East coast, uh, pretty much anything North of North Carolina, we kind of see is a little bit, uh, iffy on investing just based on, um, how much it, it actually costs to maintain the assets a little bit tougher with the weather. And also, uh, just, uh, we want landlord friendly states at the end of the day. Uh, so that boils it down to looking at the Southeast for us. Um, I have some ties to Florida, which helped quite a bit. Um, I lived there for uh, a little while and my fiance actually lived there for a little while too. So we always had an affinity for Florida and then more on the kind of economic side of things. Um, Florida to us was just, just like a total boom, especially as you saw through COVID, um, which we had picked Florida before COVID, but uh, seeing the migration patterns uh, from the Northeasterners to go down to Florida. I mean, Orlando's hit historical rent growth uh, the past year. They're, they're at the top of the charts. Um, I think everything's slowing a little bit now, but we're talking over 30% rent growth, which is just absolute insanity. Um, now, that that obviously gets baked in the deals a little bit. It's not like I just get to buy a deal and get 30% of my money right away, um, but it, it's just a huge growth market. And anytime just in general, let's just like back out. Like anytime you're in like a growth market, whether like the stock market is booming or like a certain market in real estate is booming, like you can ride the coattails of a macro trend. That's just like a great place to be. Um, it gives you more wiggle room, more margin on these deals. Uh, so if you can find one that actually makes sense, um, Florida is a super hot market, literally and figuratively. Uh, it's it's very hard to find a deal that cash flows still. Uh, we work tirelessly to, to find better and better deals uh, we're starting to find more and more of them, obviously. Um, but when you find them, I think it's really rewarding because, you know, we're going to make out, I, I assume, pretty well, um, you know, no crystal ball. But I think the trend remains pretty strong as we move forward. So we, we just had a good, good, uh, I guess, conviction on, on Florida. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned with some of the, like some of the recent news with some markets kind of having a well, decline in listing prices rather than home prices, but zero kind of residential. And that's in the residential, not commercial space. Yeah. Zero residential um, estimates did decline for like two months. In like yeah, I think- uh, the Most booming markets actually. And they actually didn't decline in the less booming ones. Right. Mm. I, uh, 
I think the markets are still strong when you look at like replacement costs, like what is the renter in Florida doing specifically? Um, a lot of the migration is still a young population. And even of the older population, they're probably buyers anyways that already had money in the Northeast. So um, even if the prices go down, it's going to kind of probably come right back up or flatten pretty quickly, I would say. Um, I also think too, that even, even with a slowdown in rent increases, if you just look at it across the board, like 30% year over year can't maintain itself anyways. And we're not projecting that in our deals. So when I underwrite these things in the fancy models, I'm not saying 30% year one, 30% year two. No, it's like 3% because that's like the safe assumption to make. So um, I don't take the 30% um, on the chin at all. I just assume that it's going to flatten out tomorrow. Like literally tomorrow, like everything's going to like settle out. Um, so I really don't worry about that too much. The one thing I will more focus on is interest rate changes. Uh, just because if you're looking at debt markets, you kind of just got to think ahead on your exit plans and what you're going to do on this property. You know, are the cap rates going to change or are you going to need a new loan? Um, so that's kind of where our focus goes. Um, not necessarily the rent increases because we try to buy properties where we know the rent's going to, you know, at a bare minimum, uh, hit this mark and we remain really conservative on that end, uh, but more kind of threading the needle on interest rates and, and what the exit plan looks like is where we like to focus generally. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's always something to keep kind of a pulse on. Um, but as long as you're underwriting the deals conservatively, which everyone touts, obviously you write it conservatively. Um, as long as you're doing the right things, checking all those boxes, making sure you're not being too aggressive. I think, I think you end up coming out. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you look at like climate, climate change and things like that? You know, there's been like more lectures recently on this topic. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, Florida specifically is a very high, uh, very hot market for insurance premiums, uh, very, very high insurance premiums in Florida, um, yeah. even in central Florida, because uh, just elevation and the amount of water and retention areas in the area. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really focus on it necessarily. Mm -hmm. Do I stay away from certain um areas in in the zoning for insurance like AE zones and stuff like that yeah maybe like we'll probably not do those deals um but as long as i can get a good insurance quote that makes sense for the the deal and we like the way the deal is with that high premium i mean it, it, if it cash flows and it cash flows and if it makes us money then i don't really mind but um the risk the risk would be just generally staying away from like the worst of the worst flood zones basically mm -hmm. other than that um, you know, weather aside, I think Florida is going to be a, uh, a market where people want to live in for a long time. Um, Miami is, you know, literally a tropical climate and people love living there. Even if Orlando and Tampa warm up a little bit, I think, uh, I think people will still stick around. So. Mm -hmm. And okay. So we have a question, uh, on the chat. So CJ is asking, so with these non-recourse loans, are you seeing the buyers assume the loans typically on exit or get fresh ones, especially with, with rates climbing? Will banks give a second position, uh, to a buyer on a commercial deal like these when buying, when buying, if the overall LTV is still conservative? Uh, yeah. So very general answer. So take it with a heavy grain of salt, but I almost never see deals done on assumptions, uh, Maybe every now and again, I actually had someone on my show that did an assumption deal. Um, the problem with assumption deals is you're typically not going to get cash flow um, right away, which is a hard sell to a lot of investors if you're looking to raise money for the deal. Um, but these people I had on the show specifically, um, they they just have that investor pool that like understands them. They have a longer term thesis on the deal, so they were willing to take that hit. And as a result, they got a great cost basis on it. When you assume a deal, basically what What's happening is the the seller of the deal has kind of a less than savory um, loan on the deal, and they're trying to get out of this deal a little bit cleaner. Um, so they're hoping to you know save fees and, and give you a better price on the deal to assume the loan. Um, but with that comes kind of worse debt structure and lower leverage. Uh, you typically typically won't see people assuming. Usually, I'll just toss the assumption part out of the way and I'll just underwrite it with fresh debt is what I do every single time. So um, yeah, can, can, you, can you get like a second position with the original lender? Like maybe, but probably not if you don't have a relationship with them anyways. Like usually they're probably gonna wanna know you to begin with. So um, yeah, I've got I, would, a I would just say right underwrite it fresh. I've got a deal or a potential deal right now where um, there's a $1.3 million loan on a $2.3 million property. Um, and uh, it's, you know, non-recourse, uh, assumable, um, you know, I've got about three, 400,000 I can put towards the deal, but 
it's not quite enough to wrap it up. And that, that loans at a 3.6% interest rate. So <laughs> when you look at the cash flow with uh, being able to assume that it, it looks pretty attractive and, and I'm kind of looking to bring on partners maybe to come up with the rest of the money to, to get it or try and get them in a seller second if they'd entertain it. But curious what you see on deals like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, without seeing the deal, this is super high level. Um, you're probably sitting at like, I don't know, mid, like mid fifties leverage on that. Maybe, um, what you could do is like, do like a tiered prep mod, like a tiered model with the equity side and have like a, um, class a shares and class B shares where the class a has equity in the deal, but they only get basically a flat 10 pref. So they get 10% cash on cash and that's it. They have no upside on the deal. No, you know, no cash on the sale, no nothing. They just get 10% of your flat. It's basically really debt when you think about it at that point, you're just getting 10% a note. Um, and then the class B would have the participation. They would get paid after the class A guys, they would have maybe like say 8% cash on cash or 8% pref. And then they would be able to participate in the upside on the sale and all that. Um, have no idea if it works for that deal specifically, but that could maybe get you to a point where some people would want to go that route with the with the kind of higher pref, and it's basically like a juicy uh, debt piece. And some investors want to participate in the upside, um, so maybe maybe if you can sort out, sort out playing with that, it might be useful. But thank you. Yep. Okay. Um... So I think we're right uh, at our time, so to say. So if you guys have any, maybe perhaps last question, uh, feel free to ask now. No? I guess, uh, I hate, I know we're already over, but I, maybe this would be a good one to wrap up on. So for someone who's in CJ's situation where, you know, he's got a deal where the numbers check out and everything makes sense, so he's ready to start raising money, what would you recommend for a beginner who's in that situation? Like what steps do you take to start actually raising that money and raising it right so you don't get in any trouble? Do you bring on a, a certain type of an attorney and they kind of babysit the whole deal for you or what? No, that's a that's a good question. And I, I probably should have brought up that point. So um, they say always be raising. Um, you want to have investors before you're ready for a deal, which is very chicken or egg. It's like, how do you get investors if you don't have anything to talk to them about? Um, at the same time, you need to have people that are ready to invest, aren't scared to invest, that know you before they're like, you're never going to get a brand new person to invest in your deal if they've never talked to you before. Generally, if they don't know you, unless you're talking accredited investors, like maybe I would target that already do these deals. And it's just a matter of, do they like the deal, right? But if you're talking just like friends and family or like your network, you're not going to have someone who just brand new, doesn't know you says, yeah, let's do it. They want to get to know you over six months a year. Sometimes it's over a year. Sometimes it's two. Um, what you can do to solve that is maybe you go and pitch them a deal that you've invested in passively yourself. Hey, I invested in this one. We did that before. I invested in this deal. You know, this is what the returns look like. These are the deals I'm trying to do. I haven't done them yet. I like these types of deals. It's what I'm aiming to do in this type of market. Uh, you could even make up your own pitch deck, you know, just, just kind of put some slides together. This is what I'm looking for. Uh, you have any questions off of that? I find if you have an actual deal to show them, you'll get more questions out of it. Like if I went through a deal today with you guys, you probably would have had a billion questions on like, what's, what's going on with this, what's going on with that. And, and that gets more interest than just talking about maybe what you're going to do instead of like having concrete stuff that like, this is what I am doing, you know? Um, so if you're in a deal uh, passively, you know, you're already in syndications, like to some level um, that's good. You like have some knowledge of it and you're looking to do the same. So like, here's, here's what I want to do. Like I'm on the passive side right now. I want to do the same thing, but on the active side, like I want to do this deal basically like copy paste. So uh, that, that can help. Okay. Um, so, so Dave, just once again, like what's the best way for people to reach to you? Yeah. My email is uh, David at David Um, that would be the best way probably. Um, and I mean, yeah, reach out. If you mentioned that you were on this uh, meetup or whatever, um, I'm more than happy to take phone calls. I just try not to like blast out my, my calendar anymore because I, I had gotten it uh, with people who would cancel on me and that's kind of frustrating. But if you're here today and you were listening and you want to reach out or if you're listening to the recording and you want to reach out with a, a specific question or something, um, my calendar has just like a, what do you want to talk about? Thanks. So just fill that out kind of nicely for me. Uh, but yeah, just email me first and then I'll get you that link if you want to talk a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm always, I'm always available to answer questions. So uh, just feel free to reach out there and, you know, I got the website too, but um, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll answer for sure. 
Okay, uh, perfect. Well, thank you so much for you know, the presentation and thanks to everyone for joining here today. Have a good night. Thanks, guys.